Hello, class. Welcome to week three of REL 131, Christian Doctrine. Um, before we get into the lecture today, I'm going to take just a few minutes to go over some samples of the Turabian Guide. Again, I don't know if uh, your school has a specific um, standard that they use for uh, term papers, but um, Turabian Guide is what I'm most familiar with. So that's, I want to just be sure that you know how to do some kind of citation style reference system for your papers. So uh, I'll take just a few minutes to go over that to give you one example, but if you prefer, or if your school prefers either uh, Chicago or um, APA or MLA, that is fine as well. But uh, this is just to give you some, uh, some sample in case you are totally unfamiliar with any of these of what this um, citation style looks like. So this is uh, a few, a few examples of treatment guide. Uh, of course, you can find this online and um, you can also, if you have the actual book, that gives you way more detail than, um, than I'm able to do here, but I just want to give you a few examples of what this looks like. So for a typical book, well, first of all, you should note that there are, this has two different formats. So on the left side, you will see the format for footnotes. Uh, you use footnotes when you cite sources in the paper. Um, so there should should be footnotes on the on the actual pages when you um, when you cite your sources. So for a typical book, you will have the author's name, first and last name, comma, the title of the book in um, italics, and then in parentheses you will have first the place of publication followed by the uh, a colon and the publisher comma and the year of publication and then close parentheses and put a comma and um, the page number that you're citing so you'll do that and um, the first time that you cite a source you want to cite it in its entirety but afterwards you can abbreviate or shorten the the uh, citation with just the author's last name and the basic title of the book and the page numbers. Uh, that's if if it's obvious uh, what the source is uh, by doing this. All right. Um, and if it's actually, if you're citing the same source multiple times in a row, um, subsequently, there's also the, the, the uh, you can also say IBID uh, period, comma, and the page number. Um, that's a way to shorten it as well. So in the bibliography, uh, which is at the, the final page, at the end of the paper, you'll have the author's name, last name, comma, first name, the title of the book in, ex, in uh, italics, followed by a period, and then the place of publication with a colon, publisher, comma, and your publication. And in this one, you will not put the page numbers. You'll put the whole source. All right. Now, if there are, there's a subtitle, uh, the subtitle, you'll put the, the main title with a uh, colon followed by the subtitle and all that in italics as well. So that's a basic book. Uh, if this is a, chapter or part of an edited book you'll put the first of all the name of the author of the specific article or chapter uh, and then the 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 chapter or article in quotation marks followed by in in the book title um ed on the notes for uh, then with the editor's name or on the bibliography edited by the editor's name. Uh, you'll see the, the rest is done uh, same kind of way. All right, if it is, 
the edited book as a whole that you're using, then you will just put the author's name, comma, ED for editor. Um, that's not the actual author of the book. It's an editor. And so you'll need to specify that and then put the book title and everything else put accordingly. If it's an ebook, uh, It starts out the same way, but then you will put the uh, either the website where you find it, or you'll put if it's on Kindle or however else you access it, um, the the library or the the place where you access the book. All right, it's a journal article. Kind of similar to the second model, you'll put the the author's name, the author of the specific article, followed by the title of the article in quotation marks, and then the title of the journal in uh, italics with the the volume or volume and or issue numbers and the the date, and then the the way that you access it if this is online. Or if it's not online, you will not. You, you do not need to put the last part. Uh, probably it is more likely, or it's easier to find sources on like this online these days. But if you do have access to a, a library that has these hard copies, that's fine too. Okay. Now, if there are over three three authors, um, especially for a journal article, uh. In the footnote, you will put the first author's name followed by E-T-A-L with a period. Uh, so that is a, a term that means that there are more than three authors, and it's a way to abbreviate that. In the bibliography, you will need to put all the names. Uh, you cannot abbreviate the same way. Uh, please note also that... Uh, it's only the first author's name that you put the last name first. And that's just a matter of the uh, spelling or the, um, what do you call it? The uh, putting this in alphabetic order, it should be, should be by the last name of the first author. All right. So that's that example. And, and then websites, uh, other website content. This is how you'll do that how you'll um, cite that. And you can list either if something is the date something's last modified or the date that you have accessed it. You'll see examples for both of those. Okay, so that is just a quick overview of Turabian Guides. If you would like a copy of this, feel free to ask me uh, for it in the next... Um, the next lesson when you submit your assignment, but you're, you definitely would be able to find this online um, or other examples and maybe even more extensive examples than this. I just wanted to be sure that you have some basic familiarity with, with um, citation styles and with Trabian specifically, since this is a theology class and uh, Trabian is what is used most often for theology and what I'm most familiar with myself. All right, so now we've gone over that. Let's get into the actual lecture for today. And I want to start with a reading from the Psalms. Or we'll be covering um, Revelation and Scripture, um, part one. But that's the, the first part of our, um, our lecture for today is about Revelation and Scripture. So let me open with this reading. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it, that I will follow your righteous laws. I have suffered much. Preserve my life, Lord, according to your word. Accept, Lord, the willing praise of my mouth, and teach me your laws. 
Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. That is Psalm 119, 105 through 112. This is actually the not only the longest psalm, it is the longest chapter of the Bible, about five pages long, and it's devoted to um, praising God's law. It's written, I believe, like an acrostic where uh, every verse starts with the subsequent letter of the um, Hebrew alphabet, or maybe not every verse, but every stanza or every series of verses. And so it goes through the whole Hebrew alphabet. Uh, that's what makes it so long. Again, it expresses uh, love and devotion to God's word and God's law. So many of the Psalms express value and reverence for God's word, including his laws. The author's of the Psalms know that God's law is good, true, beautiful, and life-giving. It provided directions for a life well-lived and for a just society. Most of all, it enabled people, individuals, and the whole nation to know God. As God made himself known to them, their proper response was to worship him to adore him and live their lives in obedience to him. And any means that God chose to reveal himself, especially his words that were written down and preserved, were cherished with the utmost sense of sacredness. We have much to learn from the Psalms. We often do not appreciate the concept of God's laws, which seem legalistic and seem to restrict our freedom. We don't like being told, do this or don't do that. We don't always understand that these laws provide proper guidance for how to live, and just as importantly, a means to respond to God's revelation of himself and to develop a relationship with him. That is what, or this is what is most essential to life, and thus, through his words, God has ultimately offered us life. Every word God gives should be cherished and valued. Today we have even more reason to value and celebrate God's word. For God has revealed himself most perfectly in the living word, which is his son, given for us. And we can know the son of God, who is Jesus Christ, through the writings of the Bible and the inner testimony of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Um, so, as we just in our lesson today, uh, as we discuss Scripture, the Bible, let us recognize this as God's word spoken to us, a testimony of God's love and desire for us to know him personally. And let us learn to give the word of God the honor it deserves. Of course, that applies especially for those of you that are Christians. I recognize that not everyone is. Um, in that case, I just ask that you come to this class with an open mind and um, openness to learn more about the Bible and more about the Holy Spirit. Uh, and uh, hopefully, you'll find that. It's valuable to uh, to know uh, there's more about these subjects, regardless of your faith tradition. Uh, it is valuable knowledge one way or the other. So hopefully we'll come at it with that type of attitude. And we'll begin now with Jones, chapter 2, Knowing God, the Doctrines of Revelation and Scripture. When God reveals divine reality to us, 
real and eternal transformation takes place. When we truly know the things of God, we will be changed, body, soul, and spirit. The doctrine of revelation explores how it is that God makes himself known to us. The doctrine of scripture examines what Christians believe about the Bible as God's revelation. Revelation is an enormous category in Christian theology. It implies that the things of God were hidden, but God acts to reveal himself to us. God uncovers the hidden things, allowing us to know him and inviting us into relationship with him. Yet, since we are limited creatures, God accommodates his revelation of himself to what we can handle. God reveals himself in history and through physical matter. Because we are sinners, this also affects how we know God, causing us to have bias and selfishness in our knowledge of God. While we recognize these difficulties, we cannot stop seeking God. True knowledge of God is available to us because God is good and wants us to know him. God communicates to us within our limitations, and he reaches out to us despite our sinfulness, healing our ability to know him. Let's look at the doctrine of revelation. God is good and reveals himself to us. Because of this, we can have confidence in our knowledge of God. There are two types of divine revelation, general and special. General revelation refers to the way God reveals himself in creation and the human conscience. Special revelation refers to God's specific revelation of himself in the history of Israel, the life of Jesus Christ, and scripture. Special revelation is not available to everyone automatically. It is revealed as something new. Special revelation is often referred to as the word of God, which, as we have seen, can refer to Jesus Christ. That means the, the term, the word of God, it can refer to Jesus Christ, the Bible, or a spoken message that witnesses to Christ and reflects the truth of Scripture. Let's look at the relationship between general and special revelation. Where should we begin when seeking knowledge of God? And what status does general revelation have in relationship to special revelation? There are four positions to be considered. One is the primacy of general revelation. According to this position, special revelation can be accepted only when it corresponds to what can be known by reflection upon the evidence given in general revelation. Thus, biblical teaching is dismissed when it does not match what we observe with the five senses or our rational reflection. Traditional theologians criticize this view, believing it restricts God's freedom, undermines the authority of Scripture, and elevates human reason too highly as a determiner of what must be true about God. The view remains influential, and it is often used by those who speak in public contexts. Uh, that would not accept special revelation. A theology drawn from general revelation, particularly nature, is known as a natural theology. Uh, number two is the primacy of special revelation. 
according to this position, special revelation should be regarded um, more highly than general revelation, which does not give us valid knowledge of God. Theologians with this view recognize that because our minds are twisted by sin, we cannot accurately discern God's revelation in creation or our own consciences. Thus, the only reliable and trustworthy revelation of God is found in Jesus Christ, revealed in Scripture. These theologians also warn us that we may use general revelation to support our own agenda rather than God's. We must be careful of sinful delusions and the idolatry of power, such as um, how the German church in the 1930s and 1940s supported Nazi teaching. Uh, if you study church history, you might learn more about that. Uh, most German churches supported the Nazis. However, there was a group called the Confessing Church that uh, that early on recognized um, how evil the Nazis and, and uh, Hitler were and saw through their lives and they resisted them and, and refused to support them. But that was a very small minority of the, uh, the churches in Germany at the time. Um, so, however, if we reject all general revelation, we may damage our ability to connect Christian truth with things or people outside the faith. We will dismiss the truth and beauty found in the arts and sciences. There are also passages in scripture that affirm God's revelation in creation. So thus many Christians look for a middle position that allows both general and special revelation. Number three, ongoing continuity between general and special revelation. A relationship of ongoing continuity between both types of revelation can be pictured. General revelation lets us know some things about God, such as that God exists and it is necessary and useful. Uh, but it has to be supplemented by the more complete knowledge of special revelation. Nature and grace are the work of the same God. Special revelation builds on general revelation, but it does not replace it. This view enables a strong apologetics. The term apologetics refers to the rational defense of the Christian faith to non-Christians. Creation often proves to be a starting point for conversation and even becomes a basis for sharing the gospel. It also establishes a common basis for dialogue between Christians and non-Christians about issues of truth and morality. Such work plays an important part in establishing international law and standards of justice. The idea that God built a moral framework into creation itself is called natural law. And then there is number four, unveiled continuity. Many Christians worry that the view of ongoing continuity fails to account for the reality of sin. Because humans and the world are fallen, we are unable to see the truth of God in natural revelation, and nature itself does not provide a pure vision of God's will. These concerns have led many theologians to envision the relationship between general and special revelation as one of unveiled continuity. In this view, 
God must remove the veil that, ha that has clouded nature before we can see the truth of God in both forms of revelation as well as their continuity. God's revelation in creation becomes clear when viewed through the special revelation, uh, which is a corrective lens. Sin leads us to misinterpret and distort God's general revelation. Uh, scripture guides us to interpret general revelation correctly and fit it with special revelation. Scripture truly is a gift for the Christian life, since without special revelation, we are unable to truly know God. In order to know God, we must recognize the particular way he has revealed himself in history. Only then can we rightly recognize the ways that the entire created order corresponds to and reveals God's plan. In Scripture, God reveals himself in ways that overcome our human limitations and sin. Let's turn to inspiration and illumination of Scripture. Two categories name the Holy Spirit's relationship to Scripture, inspiration and illumination. Inspiration refers to the Spirit's work as the author of the Scriptures in and with the human authors of the biblical texts. Illumination refers to the way that the Spirit continues to work in and with God's people to help us understand and be faithful to Scripture as we read it. The Bible, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is God's Word, and the Spirit's illuminating power helps us understand and embody that Word. The authority of Scripture rests in its author, God the Holy Spirit. There are many theories about the means of the Spirit's work of inspiration. We can exclude the view of simple dictation that the Holy Spirit spoke the exact words of Scripture as humans copied, as it neglects the human authors and diverse contexts and perspectives seen in the various writings of the Scriptures. However, we must recognize the deep unity displayed by the Scriptures, which is the result of having the common author in, in the Spirit and their common testimony to God. Christians think of the entire Bible as a story with four main parts. Creation, illustrating God's original good intention and purpose. The fall, um, with sin and death entering the world. Redemption, in which Christ brings salvation and healing and glory, in which God's final good intentions and purposes are worked out. We also recognize, as mentioned before, a connection between these texts and the God whom we meet and know through the texts. Verbal inspiration refers to the Spirit's role in inspiring the actual words of the Bible. Plenary inspiration refers to the Spirit inspiring all of Scripture. The whole Bible is the Spirit's work. The Spirit's role in inspiring Scripture was not a loose or distant process, but cooperative, intimate, and particular. We cannot read, or we cannot just read the words of Scripture, but need to understand them. Christians share much in terms 
of understanding the scriptures, Christians also share agreements on important principles for seeking to understand and interpret scripture. Read the whole book. Seek to understand confusing passages in light of other parts of scripture. Listen to the interpretations of other Christians. Pray for the Spirit to give light to understand the text. There are difficulties and differences in biblical interpretations, but these difficulties do not stop the Spirit from working. The Spirit works in individuals and in the entire Christian church across time and space. The Spirit gives illuminating power to help us understand the Bible and to transform us into living witnesses to the truth of Scripture, to bear the image of Christ and thus illumine Scripture even more brightly. The task of biblical interpretation, also known as hermeneutics, is complex, but it is full of rewards for those who make the effort. In the letter of 2 Timothy, Paul wrote of Scripture being inspired and useful for teaching, correction, and training. He viewed Scripture, and he had in mind, of course, the Old Testament at the time, because the New Testament was not yet written, but he had in mind the Old Testament uh, as Scripture. Uh, so he viewed Scripture as the writings of prophets linked with the Spirit as the source of prophetic inspiration. Christians have treated the New Testament writings with the same confidence, recognizing them also as the Word of God. Confidence in Scripture goes with confidence in the Holy Spirit. Such confidence leads us to wisdom and intimacy with God. Let's turn to the next section. Not Marcionism or Montanism, but canon. The Spirit's work is not limited to authoring the scriptures, but the Spirit was also involved in bringing the collection of texts in our scriptures to us. The, the books that make up the Christian Bible are known as the canon. This is a word that means measure or standard, uh, referring to scripture being the measuring stick for Christian faith and life. While the process of choosing these books involved human action and decision, the Holy Spirit worked through humans to bring us the Word of God. While the books that made up the canon were received by churches very early in the history of the Christian faith, it took some time for the contents of the canon to be settled. Around the year 140, Marcion proposed a list of books for the church to adopt. However, Marcion rejected the Old Testament, believing the character of God in the Old Testament was different from God revealed in Jesus Christ, or in the New Testament. The church rejected Marcion's opinion, recognizing him as a heretic or a false teacher. Though the spirits are through the Spirit's power, the church recognized as scripture the Old Testament and other books Marcion had rejected. The Christian canon includes more voices over more centuries with more complexities than Marcion would have allowed. Some people argue that the canon agreed upon is just a list reflecting the biases and opinions of those who had power at the time the New Testament collection came together. However, the early church used criteria in recognizing which texts were inspired by the Spirit and intended to become Christian scripture. Texts needed three characteristics to be considered canonical. 
uh, first to be written by the apostles uh, who had firsthand knowledge of Jesus, or at least by those that were in close association with the apostles. Uh, second, to be used broadly in the worship of faithful churches. And third, to correspond with the rule of faith or early shared summaries of Christian doctrine. The Spirit used these criteria to guide the process of canonization, which came to include our Bible from Genesis to Revelation. We are now bound to all these texts, not just the ones that easily make sense to us. The canon, though extensive, provides boundaries for the Christian life. The canon of Scripture is one of the first and most universally agreed upon teachings of the Christian faith. Since early Christianity emerged out of Judaism, it was natural that the Christian church would continue to recognize the Jewish scriptures or the Old Testament as sacred. It was also natural, given the new things God had done through Jesus, that writings about him from his own time, written by those who knew him in person and could testify reliably about him, were received as authoritative and eventually recognized as Christian scripture, the New Testament. The Montanist controversy was one issue that led the Christian church toward closing the canon, limiting the books of scripture to those we currently have in the Bible. Montanus, along with his associates, gave prophecies and claimed to speak for the Holy Spirit. In doing so, he and they raised questions about the authority of the written scriptures compared to new truth claims. The early church rejected Montanism, giving special authority to what God did around the lifetime of Jesus. The closed canon witnesses to Jesus, who is himself God's revelation. The canon of Scripture is not open to additions because the Spirit led the church to recognize the writings of Scripture and not others as true testimonies of the faith. The fact that Christians receive the Scriptures as a collection of texts written by multiple authors from many centuries and communities is a testimony to the way the Spirit chooses to work among us. The Spirit works through humans, uh, but agrees with and testifies to Jesus. Christian theology insists that testimonies of the Holy Spirit's power working in people's lives require discernment. The Bible, inspired and compiled by the Holy Spirit, is the primary authority for Christian faith and life and the key to spiritual discernment. We can be confident that the Spirit will work in our lives today in ways that are consistent with the Scriptures. All right, let's take a break here, and then we'll continue in just a moment. 